the next book and the next speaker, Dixon de Pommier, The Vertical Farm. I learned in my research that uh, there's a developer in Chicago, his name is John Edel, and he has invested four million dollars in a four-story indoor produce and fish farm. Indoor produce and fish farm, which he calls the plant. They've already planted 3,000 square feet of hydroponically grown lettuce and installed 1,400 tilapia in tanks. <laughs> the plant's part of a growing push to bring farms into metropolitan areas. The idea is that such efforts make fresh food more accessible to inner city residents and could help reduce the cost and energy of shipping products. At this point, I'll ask Dixon to pick up the story. Thank you, Moses. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for inviting me here. It's a thrill. And I'm now looking out over the audience of all of my friends that I met last night. So we can just relax and settle back for two of the most depressing books that I've ever read. And I recommended them to my students in a course that I taught at Columbia University. I'm not retired now, so this is what I do. <clears throat> One book is called The World Without Us by Alan Weissman. Some of you may be familiar with that book. It's a short book. Just says what happens if we all disappeared tomorrow with no traces of our bodies. How would the earth behave? And the earth would actually rejoice. The second book is called The Revenge of Gaia by James Lovelock. I had the pleasure of listening to him at the American Museum of Natural History about two years ago when the book came out. And it was the most charming, depressing talk I've ever heard. James Lovelock is a, an, uh, an optimistic pessimist. And it's very difficult to convince him otherwise because he's, cons he's convinced that we've gone too far. <sighs> I think that's bullshit. Okay, that's what I tell my students. That's bullshit. Our evolutionary history goes back to about 3.58 billion years. Our genetic code has a remnant of every organism that's ever lived. That's powerful biology. Let's do something about this. So that's what I tell my students. So some more gloom and doom before we get to the good part. Here's what we're trying to address. Our natural systems are falling apart. We've heard too much about that already, but probably not enough. Safe and abundant food and water supply, that's for sure. Engaging society and environmental sustainability, whatever the hell that thing means. It's a political word right now, but I'll, I'll address sustainability later. And then slowing down rapid climate change. Climate has always changed, but we can do something about the speed at which it changes because we're partially responsible for that speed. So today we find ourselves with 6.8, probably 6.9 billion people using the size of South America to grow their food. That's a big place. And that doesn't include grazing land. If you put that together, there's a group in the University of Wisconsin in Madison that's convinced we use all of it. Deforestation is a big problem because we're making room for our crops by cutting down the forests. I bet you probably knew this, but I just found this out about a year ago, that Brazil, the rainforest, generates 40% of the oxygen in our atmosphere. 40%. That's a lot. So how to slow it down? We've had lots of good advice from FAO, from Al Gore. Even he has a solution. You know, you can listen to 99% of what he says, and it's all about the problem. And then there's a 0.1% of what to do. There's more to do than that, of course. And then Wangari Maathai, Nobel Prize winner for planting, uh, I guess it was 10 million trees. And she wants to use her money now in Kenya to plant 10 billion trees. Good for her. Our population continues to grow, but don't think you're listening to Malthus here. I don't care how many people live on the earth, as long as we have enough food that's safe to eat, and enough water to drink that's safe to drink. That's all I care about. But in another 20 to 40 years from now, there might be another 3 billion of us. And even if we have enough now for us, what about them? Do we want to think about that? Of course we do. So if we use this much land already, 
that doesn't leave a heck of a lot left for those three billion people. And in fact, if we were to make the projection of how much land we'd need to set aside for another three billion, it would be Brazil. You think Brazil wants to help us out here? Probably not. So agriculture has only been around for about 11,178 years, according to the agronomist that discovered the uh, corn deposits in the Balsas Valley of Mexico. That's the earliest we can date an absolutely manipulated crop of corn. And since that time, and that's not a long time, we have advanced agriculture to the point now where it's not ecologically sustainable at any level, so we have to help it out. We have to provide pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers to make up for all of the things that nature would provide if it was just left by itself. Sure, we get our food, but we also get something called agricultural runoff. Unpreventable. Unpreventable. That's why we don't regulate it, because we can't. And the issue there is that we're trashing all of the estuaries where all these fish are coming from. Where was I born? I know some of you know that. I was born in New Orleans. I'll try to put that in another way. I was born in New Orleans. What happened there? <clears throat> well, four floods in the Mississippi River Valley, starting from just north of St. Louis, trashed the entire coastline of New Orleans all the way to Louisiana, to Brownsville, Texas, and now the latest flood, 2011, pushed it into Mexico. So now we have an international problem created by agricultural runoff. In 20 years from now, we're gonna have 80% of us living in cities. That's a good thing, because we know how to live in cities. We wanna live in cities. That's what this whole thing is about. Idea city. Let's get a better idea about the city. So far, we have not had too many good ideas because urban planning, come on, that's like military intelligence. Remember what George Carlin used to tell us? City planners would love to be able to redo the grids. I sat in an audience and listened to Mayor Bloomberg in New York City say that the one big problem in New York City is that we're a 21st century population living in a 19th century infrastructure. <sighs> this is a mayor who has an engineering degree. So I felt like saying, well, what are you gonna do about it? Well, I was a voice lost in the wilderness, unfortunately. So the reason why 70% of the carbon emissions come from cities is because they use up lots of energy. Cities are wastrels. Who's managing that system? If it was a business model, it would go out of business in an instant. So there's tons of subsidies and tons of things done to keep these things running. Conclusion, today's cities are not sustainable, neither were yesterday's cities. By the way, I took that picture. So where are our solutions gonna come from? They're gonna come from nature. That's where we came from. It's where we still are. We are still part of nature. Ask anybody who's caught Lyme disease, they'll tell you. So if we wanna get some answers, let's go back and look at the best sustainable system I know, and that's the ecosystem. Anytime you use that word eco, though, you're bound and determined to include in it all of these factors. The sustainability of the ecosystem is dependent on biodiversity and balance and resiliency. You damage it, it repairs itself. You cut your finger, you heal. You damage nature, it heals. So, if nature has all the answers, what's your question? What is your question? Nature has all the answers. What would be your question? I'll show you what mine is. Mine is, that's half of my question. My full question is this, because if we don't do that, then our life on this planet is finite. I don't want to think that way. You know, I don't want Alan Weissman to be right. I don't want James Lovelock to have the last laugh. So I want to create from scratch 
this using the principles of ecology as I go. And I want technology to save the day as it has every other time. Technology saves the day. That's what derailed Malthus's hypothesis. Every time we look for a silver bullet, where do you think that silver bullet comes from? We have a center in our brain that we should rename the silver bullet. Louis Pasteur said once that luck favors the prepared mind. You know what he really meant by that? He meant that if you had a good education, you can tell when you've been lucky. How in the heck do you know if you've been lucky? At roulette you might know, but you know, some other kinds of luck are harder to perceive. So if we're gonna imitate nature and reconstruct a city in which all of the principles of ecology take place within that city to make it truly sustainable, we have to begin with bioproductivity. Because if bioproductivity is the keynote for ecosystems, it's gotta be ours too. We have to do this and we have to do it soon. I have a great-grandchild. I would like to take that great-grandchild to dinner <clears throat> at a restaurant that serves food from the building next to the restaurant. That's what I want to do. So the rise of urban agriculture is here. It's here. I just read something this morning that the University of Toronto has a big urban agriculture department you know, planning, oh, lots of other things too. Rooftops, empty spaces between buildings. People want to grow their own food. They want it to be safe. They want it to be reliable. They want it to be theirs. Outbreaks of food diseases, etc., have caused this to happen. We know how to do all this. This is not rocket science. Like the other guy said, oh, wait a minute, I'm a rocket scientist. But even if it was a rocket science, and if it was a brain surgery, we do those two things really well. That's good stuff. We can apply them to this problem and solve it. We already know how to grow food indoors, and lots of it too, lots of it. The ecosystem of the future, not such distant future, will look like this, where we're processing our own wastes back into energy and water. How do we do that? Oh, well, let's start with the advantages of doing this first with a vertical farm. No agricultural runoff, year-round crop production, no crops lost from severe weather events, uses 70% less water than outdoor farming, allows repair of damaged ecosystems. We'll get to that. Other things too, we can remediate gray water back into drinking water. New York City discards one billion gallons of water a day as gray water. Try to tell that to an audience in Amman, Jordan, like I did, and they almost hung me up by a tree. Creates new jobs, supplies fresh produce for inner city dwellers, if that's your agenda. Uses abandoned city properties if you're the mayor. You can grow fuel, biofuels too, and you can grow drugs that come from plants. There's a lot of advantages of this. And most of all, you don't use a lot of land here. For every outdoor acre, or for every indoor acre rather, per crop, depending on the crop, you can generate 10 outdoor acres of land that you no longer have to farm. You can let it return to nature. In fact, nature does a good job of repairing itself if we can just leave it alone. It took a war in 1952 to create a zone between North and South Korea called the DMZ, which is the most beautiful place on Earth. How ironic. It's the only place that we're not allowed to go. Keep people out and you're okay. So my new book will be called The Earth With Us. Chernobyl, the wildlife even came back. Well, I didn't say it should have, but it did. What can we grow indoors? <laughs> what do you want? So where will the water come from? Well, we already make it. And they're already doing this in Santa Ana, California. There are some marketing problems. Yes, they've had a few uh, issues. Yeah, well, you see that one. This little guy over here never drink water. That's why the French are so big on wine, I guess. But in Santa Ana, they had to percolate it over the ground in order to get the people to drink it. The energy will come from reprocessing our own feces. You can actually dry that down and burn it. In what? In a plasma arc gasifier. Wait till you see what happens in Japan after this last nuclear accident. 
to the concept of plasma or gasification, I predict that that whole country will run on it eventually. How do we start? Create a prototype. It's my favorite one, it's a third grade prototype. Here's another one. This one's by Weber Thompson in Seattle. This one won a prize for design. However, I've got two and a half minutes to tell you about this. This idea started 11 years ago in a classroom. Five years ago, we put it on the internet. At that point, there were no hits on Google. Today, type out the words vertical farm, you'll get 39 billion, million, sorry, million. It's still a lot. <laughs> okay, make it billion. <laughs> you get four million image hits. Guess what? If you had invited me here last year, I would have had to tell you, well, you know, there, there will be some vertical farms. I promise you, there will be. Guess what? We now have four vertical farms. Here's one. I was just there three weeks ago at the Seoul Digital Forum. They took me and showed it to me. They said, because of a talk you gave here in 2008, we went ahead and did this. That's the country of Korea. There's another one in Japan called New Veggie. They have a website. Please visit it. It's fantastic stuff. Plant Lab is going up in Holland. It's three stories of vertical farming underground. What? Underground? How does that work? They're using blue and red LED lighting, special LED lighting that they developed. And their claim is, I can't verify this, their claim is that white light, pure light from sun, has an inhibitory frequency also that keeps the plants from growing maximally. If you exclude that frequency and just expose them to the red and blue, they grow maximally. They grow three times faster than they would outdoors. Amazing. Here's one going up in Jackson, Wyoming, not quite finished yet. Here's one in Milwaukee. Time to stop talking. Time to stop talking. Time to start doing. Time to start doing. Cities already with vertical farms. Manchester, England will open one in July and I'll be there for it. Cities planning vertical farms. Many more on the books. Here's a whole list of them if you're interested. Let the earth alone. Live our lives sustainably inside this bubble that we can create, basically. The urban shell. Thanks. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to see you at the party. You good.